we're thinking together about reading the Bible like Peter and Paul. We've thought about describing what apostolic, Christocentric interpretation of the Bible looks like as we find it in the New Testament. Uh, we spent our last hour thinking about defending it from some reservations and suspicions that some people, even those who believe Scripture to be the Word of God, may have about reading every part of the Old Testament as anticipating in some way, shape, or form the work of Christ. Well, now we want to talk about deploying apostolic Christocentric interpretation. Uh, being persuaded why is good, but practicing the how is another thing. So that's what we want to investigate now. How can we read? How can we teach the Bible like Peter and Paul? We're not apostles. We haven't studied the Bible immediately with the risen Lord Jesus as they did on that Resurrection Sunday. And we gather from Acts 1 over the 40 days until his ascension. He was teaching them. Uh, we didn't have that in-depth, hardcore seminary course. Uh, in biblical hermeneutics from the, the Lord Jesus himself. We certainly don't have it, the special inspiration from the Holy Spirit that secures our inerrancy the way the New Testament writers did. Um, and we saw last time that some people con conclude from that difference between the apostles and us, or the difference between the New Testament writers and us, that we should not follow their lead in areas where they have not already shown us the connections between an Old Testament event or person and its fulfillment in Christ, uh, because we just we may get it wrong. Um, my own conviction is that in those passages where they have not shown us, or for those Old Testament texts and events that they've not shown us a connection directly, we are much, on much safer ground to try to apply what we see them doing than to come with some other approach to interpreting the Bible altogether. That we want to follow their lead. Um, and the, the Lord has given us a lot, of, a lot of demonstration of how that works. 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon, master of illustration, tells a story about a venerable divine who patiently explained to a young preacher that just as there is from every town and village in England, a road that somehow leads to London, the metropolis of the, of the kingdom. So also, there is, from every text of scripture, a road to the metropolis of the scriptures, which is Christ. And the preacher's task, or any of us as Bible readers' task, is to find that route that brings us from that passage to the capital to Christ, the center of God's redemptive plan and word. I like that picture. Uh, it, it fits with the journeying picture that we saw in, uh, in Luke 24 on the Emmaus Road. Uh, it, uh, it, those two kind of influenced a, a book that I wrote in 2015 uh, called Walking with Jesus Through His Word, Discovering Christ in All the Scriptures, because that, that's a helpful metaphor. We're actually going to use that metaphor in this lecture because uh, we're, we're going to ask, what are the ways that we can take that trip from the variety of locations and terrains in the Old Testament and reach Christ as our destination? Now, we have a lot of great resources available to us to help us glimpse uh, how the paths that connect Old Testament passages to their fulfillment in Jesus. Um, and I want to mention a few of those, just so you can, can look at them. First of all, there are the cross-references in a Bible that has well-selected cross-references. Uh, they're often in fine print, so it's hard to look at, but they're valuable to draw those connections if they're well-selected. And then there are notes in recent study Bibles, such as the Reformation Study Bible and the ESV Study Bible that make connections between Old and New Testament. Uh, there's a whole series of books published by PNR called The Gospel in the Old Testament, uh, you can find them in your church library, if your church has a library, or you can find them online, um, talking about the message how Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Daniel and David, uh, how God preaches Christ through all of them. And then if you uh, are really hearty, there is a big one-volume commentary on the New Testament's use of the old, edited by Gregory Beale. 
Uh, as I mentioned, he teaches now at Westminster Seminary, Philadelphia, and Donald Carson, who teaches at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament came out in 2007. But all those resources will not really help us unless we begin to get a mindset that we're looking for the I was using the journey image. Let's use another one. We're looking for the patterns in the tapestry of Scripture. We're beginning to think biblically about the deep substructure of the Bible, which is redemptive in purpose and historical in design and Christ-focused in destination. In this time that the New Testament calls, the time we're living in, the fullness of the times, and the New Testament also calls the time we're living in, from the time of the apostles, the last days. So we don't just need data, we need a way of seeing the patterns. Um, our minds, as we heard in Luke 24, our minds need to be opened by Jesus, and our foolish, sluggish, unbelieving hearts need to be set on fire to believe. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Uh, and here's where I think the journey image is, is helpful to us. Uh, we have very clear road signs at points. Uh, and these are what we've already begun to look at. We'll look at for just a few more minutes. Uh, the types, the things that are specifically identified in the New Testament from Old Testament passages that are fulfilled in Christ. Old Testament, New Testament connect connections that are overtly, obviously, explicitly identified and most Christians agree on those types. But then second, the theological resources of our Reformed confessions and catechisms also give us a way of looking at the whole Bible, especially with the themes of covenant, covenant Lord and covenant servant, and then with the themes of prophet, priest, and king, those offices in the Old Testament that uh, God used to convey his word and his presence and his rule to Israel, those things help us to have some, some categories, some landmarks. I'll explain that a little bit more uh, as we get to the second part of the lecture. Uh, and, and those two things, actually the covenant theme is going to be the third part of the lecture. It shows us the lay of the land of the whole Bible. So road signs, Landmarks and the lay of the land. Uh, travel with me. Hmm? Travel with me. Okay, road signs. These are the Old Testament themes, events, individuals, institutions, uh, motifs that the New Testament explicitly identifies as coming to fulfillment in Christ and his redemptive work. They're clearly labeled. They're like interstate exit signs to tell you exactly where you are, when you need to get off. Little disagreement among Bible-believing students of Scripture over them. Many refer to Old Testament narratives and then are commented on in the New Testament. And these have to do with what biblical scholars call types. The Greek behind our English word type is tupas. You can hear it, type. And it refers to a pattern, something that impresses its shape on another material. Uh, flesh and blood time and space, persons, events, and institutions that God actually embedded in the real history of Israel to serve also as previews of what he would do in Christ. One place where we read this type language is in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, where Paul calls Adam a type, a tupas, of the coming one. Adam's a pattern. Christ fits the pattern. Now, actually, the relationship between a type and the fulfillment in Christ is a little bit complex because the type is both like and unlike. And we see that clearly in Adam and Christ in Romans 5. Adam and Christ are alike in that in each we have this principle, one decides for all. One decision by one man affects all whom he represents. Covenant representation. Sometimes call it federal representation. One decides for all. Adam did it with terrible results. We looked at that in the first lecture. Christ did it with glorious results because he obeyed perfectly and he sacrificed for us and now we receive righteousness and Christ. Correspondence, 
and heightening. That's the way a German scholar who did a really wonderful work on the typological interpretation of the Old Testament in the New Testament. His name is Leonhard Goppelt, G-O-P-P-E-L-T. Um, <laughs> book is hard to find these days. It was translated finally into English. Uh, but he says, all, every time you move from Old Testament to New Testament, you have correspondence, similarity, and heightening. Something is new, different, better about Christ. Now, obviously, in Adam and Christ, the newness is really, really better. It's a huge contrast. Elsewhere, though, you go from good to the best. So, for example, Hebrews talks about God speaking through prophets. That's very good. But then he says, right at the beginning of Hebrews, in these last days God has spoken in his Son, who's the radiance of his glory, who upholds all things by the word of his power. Good revelation from God through the prophets. Far better in the Son. Chapter 3, Moses, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, faithful. Faithful as a servant in God's house. Read Numbers 12, it says so. But Christ, faithful as a son over God's house. Later in Hebrews, animal sacrifices did their job in the Old Testament sanctuary. They cleansed externally so people could worship God, but they couldn't get to the conscience. And they had to be repeated over and over and over again. But they were pointing to the best, Christ's sacrifice, which cleanses the conscience and accomplishes it all once for all. So sometimes the New Testament authors label these road signs with the very language of type, like Romans 5. Um, or also Paul labels the language of type in 1 Corinthians 10 when he talks about Israel's wilderness experience and than the temptations that we face as New Covenant people. Sometimes they make the connection just as clear, but they don't necessarily use type language. For example, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul draws the parallel between Adam and Christ in that earlier letter, earlier than Romans, and the parallel is just as clear, even though he doesn't call Adam a type at that point. Um, other passages uh, we know that the Old Testament sanctuaries, the tabernacle and the temple, the New Testament says those were really pointing to God dwelling with his people, first of all, in Christ. John 1.14 says the, wor the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. A very specific term that he uses there. Tented among us as the pillar of cloud and fire was over the tent in the middle of the camp of Israel. And then, of course, in John 2, Jesus says, destroy this temple, his body. In three days, I'll raise it up. So he's the temple. But then, of course, later in the New Testament, because we're united to Christ, other writers say, actually, we are also the temple built out of living stones in which God now dwells by his spirit, 1 Peter chapter 2. So explicit quotations, comparison language, echoes from one text to another, <coughs> Another example, quickly, Jesus says to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, we remember that incident in the wilderness when Israel was grumbling and wanted to go back home and God sent serpents among them, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Very striking preview of Christ being our curse bearer. So, seeing such road signs is the first step on learning to read the scripture as the apostles did, they point us the way. Happily, there's not much controversy about them. So, we're going to go on to the second step. But before we do, let me make one suggestion. Let me suggest that the types on which all Bible-believing Christians are, are in agreement, we see that, they're not the exception to the rule. They're just the most explicit expression of the principle that we're going to see all the way through Scripture, that God designed the previous history of Israel with a whole series of patterns that reach their fulfillment in Christ. They're not the exception. They're just the clearest places where we see the practice, the pattern that shows throughout the tapestry of Scripture. Well, now to landmarks. Okay, street signs, 
clear, explicit, pointed. Landmarks. These are biblical elements and themes, especially that are built into the offices of covenantal mediation that God gave to Israel, prophets, priests, and kings. These offices that now converge in Christ. Landmarks are not as specific as street signs, but a really looming landmark can still help us get our bearings in unfamiliar territory. Our daughter and son-in-law and four of our grandchildren live in Colorado Springs. If you've ever been to the Springs, you know that it's really pretty easy anywhere in town to kind of get the lay of the land because you know that the plains are off to the east, the Rockies are off to the west, and Pikes Peak is standing always visible, almost always visible, unless there's you know, heavy clouds. And you can know where you are, north and south, by kind of lining up with Pikes Peak. Well, I, I think of prophets, priests, and kings are sort of like Pikes Peak. I also got to go once to Tanzania, northern Tanzania, and I saw Mount Kilimanjaro, which is amazing. And everywhere in Moshi and Arusha, those northern Tanzania towns, if you can see Kilimanjaro, you not only know which way is north, but you kind of know where you are west and east as well. Well, Scripture offers these landmarks, um, prophets, priests, and kings. They are the officers, <coughs> covenant mediators that stood between God's people Israel, defiled as they were, sinful as they were, wayward as they were, and his dangerously consuming holiness. So their role in the Old Testament was kind of to be both buffers and bridges. They were buffers. They, they provided kind of insulation. That's why the people of Israel, when they got to Mount Sinai, said, Moses, don't let God speak to us directly. You go up the mountain. You get the words. You bring them down to us. Buffer us from his consuming holiness. And, of course, the command was that the people of Israel shouldn't touch the mountain either because he was so dangerous. Yet, he resolved to live right in the midst of Israel, right? In, his, in the middle of the camp was the tabernacle. When they left Sinai, it had all been constructed. And there he was in the middle of Israel. So they were bridges, too. So the, the sons of Aaron and the greater tribe of Levi were the buffers and the bridges around the tabernacle and served in the presence of God on behalf of the other tribes of Israel. Buffers and bridges because God as holy as he is and as dangerous as his holiness is to us in our impurity loves to be with his people and so he's provided this way now the prophets priests and kings those figures of ancient Israel show us ministries that converge and climax in Christ in his work this is not my new brilliant insight. I learned this from others. Anything probably valuable I've ever taught, I've learned from others. That better be right. In fact, the Reformed catechisms from the Protestant Reformation make this very point as they describe Jesus' work. Heidelberg Catechism, 1561, from Germany, answers the question, why is Jesus called the Christ, meaning anointed? And the answer is, because he has been ordained by God the Father and anointed by the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance, our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and continually pleads our cause with the Father, and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. Heidelberg Catechism, 1561. Almost a century later, the Westminster Assembly wrote two catechisms, larger and shorter, and in the shorter catechism, they explained the work of Jesus in answer 23, Christ, as our Redeemer, executeth the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. And then in the next three answers, they unpack what those mean. We're going to look at those in just a moment. 
But that threefold analysis of what Jesus has done for us, prophet, priest, and king, is really actually rooted in the Bible. If you look at Deuteronomy 17 and 18, for example, as Moses is preparing the people of Israel to go into the land of promise, he gives directions related to kings and priests and prophets. He says to the kings, they're to copy out by hand the Torah. At Westminster, we have a copy of the Torah scroll, and it extends about two-thirds of the way, when we had it unfolded, around two-thirds of the way around our chapel. It's long. Can you imagine the king having to copy that out by hand? That was the command, so that he would internalize it and not become arrogant, so that he would follow the law of God as he exhibited, as he exercised rule and justice in Israel. Then the beginning of chapter 18 gives some instructions about the priests because they're devoted to the service of God. They don't have farmland to provide for them, so Israel is to provide tithes and offerings to feed the priests. And then most of chapter 18 talks about the prophets. It says Israel's not supposed to try to probe the mysteries of the universe in the way the pagans do, by consulting the dead or by doing magic or occult things. They're to listen to the prophet whom the Lord will raise up. There are the three. And so we see them then unfolding in the history of Israel. By the time we get to the time of the exile, all three bodies of officers have failed terribly. And so God gathers them together in a couple of verses in Jeremiah, and he accuses each of those offices of having been unfaithful. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8, God is displeased with unfaithful priests, unfaithful shepherds, those are the kings, and unfaithful prophets. Or, Jeremiah 18, 18, God has said through Jeremiah that the priests will not get to teach the law anymore. That was one of their roles. And the wise men, that's a part of the king's role, will not have wisdom anymore, and the prophets will no longer receive a new word from God, prophet, priest, and king. And of course, in the New Testament, we hear various passages. We talk about Jesus as a prophet like Moses. Peter says that in Acts chapter 3 when he's preaching in the temple. Jesus is the prophet like Moses that you're supposed to listen to. We have Jesus described as our great high priest in Hebrews 10, as the anointed king in in Peter's Pentecost sermon. Uh, that he is the one who is now Lord and Christ, ruling at the Father's right hand. In fact, the first four verses of the letter sermon to the Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, brings together all three offices of Jesus. And then the rest of the letter unpacks what those are like. Starts in many parts, in many ways, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his Son. There's the prophetic ministry of Jesus. Better than a prophet, but he brings revelation. And then he goes on to talk about Jesus as the heir and also the one seated at God's right hand. That's the kingly role. And he's thinking of Psalm 110, which is a key text in Hebrews. But he also talks about Jesus having made purification for sins. That's Jesus' priestly ministry, which is really the theme of the whole book of Hebrews, according to Hebrews 8, 1. So as we see in the Old Testament, prophetic, royal, and priestly figures functioning as intermediaries of the Lord's truth, authority, and holiness to his people, and we see themes related to those offices, then we should always be asking the question, how do these lead us to Christ? Some of the occupants of those offices are relatively faithful, David is faithful a good part of the time. That's why he becomes kind of the benchmark for later kings. Not always, but relatively faithful. Some priests are faithful. Some prophets are faithful. Some are not. Most of them, well, all of them, because they're children of Adam, are are a mixture of both. They all fell short in one way, shape, or form. Let's look a little bit at those three landmarks in a little bit more detail. Christ, the final prophet, the Father's last best word. The Shorter Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, 24, says Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. Now Israel's prophets were called, first of all, 
to see and to hear. Before they were called to speak and to show, they were to see and to hear. They were called to see God's glory. Moses saw it on Mount Sinai. Prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel were given visions where they saw the glory of the Lord, as Isaiah says, high and lifted up in his temple, seeing God's glory and hearing God's word. First, they need to listen. Isaiah says in Isaiah 50, the Lord has given me the, t- the ear of a disciple to hear the word of the Lord and then to speak it with a faithful tongue. So Moses saw God's glory on Mount Sinai, and as we read in the, in the Pentateuch in Numbers 12, God spoke to him mouth to mouth, clearly not in riddles. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. He's the prophet like Moses, to whom we must listen. That's actually the implication of the Father's word to Peter and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my son, beloved, my beloved one. Him you must listen to. It's an echo of Deuteronomy 18. He is the prophet like Moses, but of course more, far more than a prophet. The glory of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration shows that he's really the Lord who appeared to Moses. But the prophets, having seen and heard, then are sent from God's presence to speak and to show. And to show, especially in miraculous demonstrations of the authority God has given to them. When you think about the miracles in the Old Testament, typically they are associated not with kings and not with, uh, not with priests, but with prophets. The ten plagues of Moses, right? the miraculous feeding of Israel and provision of water for Israel in the wilderness through Moses, the healings and the other miracles given through Elijah and Elisha, signs that demonstrated their authority as spokesmen of God, but also that illustrated their message. So the miracles of Jesus are signs that demonstrate that he speaks from God, from the Father. In fact, Jesus says, if you want testimony, Look at the works that the Father has given me to do. And Paul says as an apostle, God gave me signs to show that I'm really speaking on Jesus' behalf as well. But of course the prophets speak, and they speak sometimes words of judgment. Sometimes they're like prosecuting attorneys, pressing God's case against his guilty people. Sometimes they speak words of comfort and hope and promise as well. Words of judgment, just to give you one example. Isaiah chapter 5 picks up the picture of a vineyard. It's the song of a vineyard. Isaiah says, My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done? And so he talks about destroying the vineyard and making it vulnerable to invasion. And actually, two chapters before that extended picture in Isaiah, God said specifically to Israel's leaders, this is Isaiah 3, verse 14, the Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. It is you who have devoured my vineyard. So God has something against specifically the leaders who were supposed to tend his vineyard. Now put alongside that one more Old Testament passage, a passage at the very end of 2 Chronicles that explains why Judah went into Babylonian captivity. As they sum up at that point the history of Judah, the southern kingdom, the kingdom that was under the reign of David's sons, the summary is this, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people and there was no remedy. Now, I don't know if you put those strands together. Maybe you did, because those strands all come together in a story that Jesus told in the week before he went to the cross. It's the story of the wicked tenant farmers uh, 
a vineyard owner, prepares the vineyard. The details are all from Isaiah 5. And he lets it out to tenants who will rent, and then they're supposed to give him some of the proceeds of the crop during the harvest season. But instead, they mock his messengers, and they abuse them. And then finally, the vineyard owner sends his son, and him they kill. Jesus' enemies didn't always get his parables. <laughs> that one they understood. They knew that he was talking about what they were plotting behind the scenes. And you see what Jesus is doing. He's saying, I am the climactic spokesman of God, coming to claim for my Father the glory and the praise and the worship that he deserves, and you will put me to death. So, Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophets. He's even the fulfillment of prophets who, in terms of their own character, don't look a lot like Jesus. Take, for example, Jonah. Jonah, the prophet sent to the Ninevites, who I was once assigned, a t in a four-part series, I was once assigned to preach on Jonah chapter 2, and I thanked the pastor who assigned that text to me because that's the only chapter of the four chapters of Jonah where Jonah is not a complete jerk. <laughs> in the first chapter, he's running away from God because he doesn't want to preach to the Ninevites. They might repent and God might be merciful. In the third chapter, he's resenting the fact that they did repent and God did show mercy. In the fourth chapter, he's grumbling about the gourd plant and has no pity for the people made in God's image. Doesn't look like Jesus very much in terms of his character, in terms of his attitude toward people who are enemies of God's people. But Jesus says, you can read it in Matthew 12, the sign given to this generation is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Not only that, Jesus also says, Jonah preached to the pagans, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now he does it through his apostles. So you have the preview of the spread of the gospel that we see in the book of Acts. Jonah, even Jonah, there's a lot of heightening and contrast, but there's also correspondence. Death, burial, resurrection, preaching to the pagans. It's in Jonah, and in so much better a way, it's in Jesus. So, everywhere we run across people speaking the word of God in the Old Testament. The prophets and others who speak the word of God. Through whomever the word comes, we could ask the question, what is the path from this prophet, this spokesman, whether he's faithful or flawed or some of each, to Jesus, the word made flesh, the Father's final and best word. Priest. I want to go to two more landmarks, then we're going to pause for a moment. Priest, the great high priest. The focus of the priest's calling was reconciliation and, as a result, access to the presence of God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism describes the work of the priest in this way. Christ exudes, executes the office of a priest in his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. So that's the heart of the priest's work. But the calling of Israel's priest was complex. It was broader than sacrifice and prayer. It had to do with the sanctuary. It had to do with separation from pollution and compassion for the needy because the sanctuary was holy territory. So it was also linked to holy time in the Old Testament, to the Sabbaths and the yearly feasts and the sabbatical years every seven years and the jubilee year every 50 years, the year of jubilation. Of, of liberation. And the priests were also associated with other forms of separation from what defiles. Holy food, holy farms, don't plant wheat and oats together, said the Old Testament law. Holy clothes, no wheat and cotton in the same piece of clothing. Holy bodies, cleansing of leprosy. Holy buildings, if there's mildew in your house, the priest needs to decide whether it needs to be torn down. So all those laws, kosher dietary laws, rules of ceremonial cleansing, all related in somehow to the priest's work. And Jesus comes not just as the sacrifice and as the one who prays for us always with the Father, but also to cleanse and to purify. He cleanses the temple of the money-making business that distracts people from prayer. He cleanses lepers of their disease 
that had excluded them from God's congregation. He pronounces all foods clean now. We need to eat and drink to the glory of God, but there's no non-kosher foods anymore because Christ is gathering all kinds of people and making them holy in their heart. He cleanses hearts, making sinners into saints. The priests received the tithes, so they were also those charged to care for those who need compassion for the widow and the orphan and the alien as well as for themselves. Jesus comes and you see how often in his ministry he extends priestly ministry of compassion to widows and to children and to marginalized people. So all of that is Christ's priestly work. And in it all, he makes us a kingdom of priests. That was what God described Israel as being in, in Exodus 19. And Peter says we are a kingdom of priests as well. And we have sacrifices to offer. Not bloody animal sacrifices to atone for sins, but we have sacrifices. So Paul says, Romans 12, that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And Hebrews says, Hebrews 13, that we offer a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And that when we care for others in need in the body of Christ, we are offering sacrifices pleasing to God. So about every priestly figure and all these themes related to the presence of God and purity and sacrifice and atonement, in the Old Testament we should be asking what's the path that leads from this priest or this ceremony or this regulation, faithful or flawed, pure or polluted, superficial or substantive, what's the path that leads to Jesus, the great high priest, who offers the final sacrifice and rose again? Anointed King of Kings, one more landmark. The focus of the King's calling is wise, righteous rule and strong defense against the assaults of enemies. The Shorter Catechism, verse, uh, uh, answer 26, says it this way. Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all of his and our enemies. You heard how many military terms were in there? Subduing, defending, restraining, conquering. Kings are warriors. Kings are also leaders and judges. <coughs> you may remember that in the days of Samuel, as Samuel's judgeship was coming to an end, Israel came and demanded that he ordain now, consecrate, anoint a king for them. We want a king like all the other peoples. Now their motives were all wrong in asking for a king like all the other peoples, but they understood what a king was for. They said we want a king to rule us, to judge us, that is, and to go out before us and fight against our enemies. To rule and to fight. And so when Saul was first anointed as king, he started well. He started fighting on behalf of Israel, and God gave him some victories. Later on, he didn't believe God anymore. And God appointed David, a man after his own heart. And David started exactly after his anointing in 1 Samuel 16. He goes out in 1 Samuel 17 to fight against the great champion of the Philistines of the pagans, Goliath. Jesus is the royal champion who defends his people and disarms their enemies, not with the power of a sword, but through the weakness of his cross. Colossians 2 and Hebrews 2 both talk about Jesus' suffering in military language, about his disarming enemies, about his nullifying the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and setting the devil's slaves free. That's, that's kingly military language. Jesus is the one who in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem is hailed by the crowds as the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's an echo of Psalm 118, which in turn is an echo of what David said when he went out against Goliath. I came against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Jesus comes in the name of the Lord to do battle. Not the battle the crowds expected. They thought he was going to throw the Romans out. No, to do a much harder battle, to do battle against Satan himself on the cross five, six days later after his entry into Jerusalem. So Jesus is the one who fits the last words of David, who rules justly over men in the fear of God. Peter, in fact, speaking to Cornelius, who knew 
what kings were about, since Cornelius was an army officer. Peter says that Jesus was anointed by God's Spirit at his baptism, this is in Acts 10, to heal those oppressed by the devil. That's military language. Satan is the enemy that Jesus came to confront and conquer. He destroyed the devil. Or as Revelation says, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who conquered by becoming the lamb slain. So about every king, about every judge, we should be asking, what is the path from this warrior, ruler, judge, faithful or flawed, just or corrupt, bold or fearful, wise or foolish, what is the path that leads from him to Jesus, the King of Kings, who defeated our great enemy and to re- directs us with his wisdom? So every prophet, priest, and king in Israel's history, by virtue of his office, however well or poorly he fulfilled the office, was a landmark pointing Israel's hopes forward to the final, fully faithful prophet, priest, and king, Jesus the Anointed. Some were somewhat faithful previews of the prophet, priest, and king to come. Others were almost negative images, the antithesis of the true mediator. But the failures, too, served the purpose. They showed how great the need was for Jesus, the one who was to come. And that gives us some texture as we read Old Testament texts. Is this about revelation, prophetic work? Is this about reconciliation, the priestly work? Is this about rule, the kingly work, and how they come together in the person of Christ? So we've looked at road signs and we've looked at landmarks. Now let's look at the lay of the land. This is this is pervasive in the Bible, but it sometimes is a little harder for people to see. We can we can find help discerning the network of pathways and avenues that connects every part of Scripture to Christ by taking another step back from the clear road signs. Those are the types identified by the New Testament writers and the noticeable landmarks. Those are the officers, prophets, priests and kings. Now get a bigger picture of the whole biblical terrain to view the lay of the land. The lay of the land, in short, is this one covenant of grace that structures the topography, we might say, of redemptive history, structures the Bible, ties it all together. So as we read scripture anywhere, we want to connect it to Christ because he is the only mediator between God and man. That's Paul's words, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, the only mediator between God and man. And he is the mediator and guarantor of the new covenant, which is the covenant of grace in its fullest form. Now, imagine another scene with me. Uh, You're not now in Colorado Springs looking up at Pikes Peak, but you're somewhere maybe up in the Rockies, a mountain forest on a cloudy afternoon, There are no road signs, there are no trail markers, there are no landmarks to be seen. And what seemed when you set out to be a well-worn path has disappeared into a thicket. But you're an experienced trailblazer. And you come upon a flowing stream. And you know that every stream on that mountain flows down somehow or other to the lake in the valley. And beside that lake is the town that offers comfort and refuge from the coming storm. What direction are you going to head now? Upstream? No, no. You're going to go downstream, however you can, wading through the stream or staying on its its course, because you know gravity is pulling its snout. It shows you the lay of the land. You want to go downstream because the flow of the brook shows you the lay of the land. The covenant idea, the covenant structure of how God relates to his people is that stream that shows us the whole flow of Scripture. Because the Bible is a book all about the relationship between God and the people that he made in his image. It's a, it's a, it's a story, it's a, a true historical story of a relationship that went through, basically is going through now, four phases. There's the honeymoon period, creation, the pristine joy and communion, that Adam and Eve enjoyed with our Creator at the beginning. And then there's the fallout, the fall, where intimacy is disrupted by our rebellion. And now we're in a process of redemption where God is restoring communion in this relationship, first in anticipation form in the Old Testament, then accomplished by Jesus in his earthly ministry, his obedience, his life, his death, his resurrection, his outpouring of the Spirit, and now being applied by the Holy Spirit. That's all 
That's all the third chapter. It's a long chapter. But then finally the consummation that we're looking forward to. Joy and communion restored fully and secured forever when Jesus returns in the new heavens and the new earth. Now the Bible way to say relationship is covenant. So to get the lay of the land that shows how even faint footpaths lead to Scripture's metropolis, to use Spurgeon's image, we need to follow this theme of this covenant relationship between God, the Creator Lord, and us, His human creature servants. Now, if you wonder whether covenant is that pervasive, I would just invite you to look in your Bible at the page before Genesis 1 and the page before Matthew 1. Now, this probably won't work if you have a study Bible, which has two or three preliminary essays. But otherwise, I'm almost sure that before Genesis 1, you have a page that says, Old Testament. And before Matthew 1, you have a page that says, New Testament. You know that. We know it so well, we often don't think about what that means. Old Testament, New Testament. Where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? It, it, First of all, think about old and new. For one thing, that shows us those two great divisions of the Bible, which has characterized the scriptures from the time that the apostles finished writing the New Testament canon. Those really describe the fact that God is working in history, that this relationship has a history, old and new. He's moving in history toward his agenda for history. He's directing history toward his good goal. But then secondly, what about that word testament? Now in our day, testament appears most often in the term last will and testament, which is a, doc a document by which some individual directs how his resources, how his estate will be distributed once he or she has died. Testament has come into our English versions in the, new, in the Bible through Latin translations in which testamentum, that Latin word, replaced the Greek term diatheke, which meant last will and testament, but also was used to apply to the, the concept of a covenant in the Old Testament translation, which we call the Septuagint, and then it was used in the New Testament by the apostles and the other writers, diatheke, it's a covenant. Jesus uses that term in instituting the Lord's Supper, Luke 22, Paul uses that term in 2 Corinthians 3. I mentioned Hebrews talks a lot about the New Covenant, Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10. Now, like a last, last will and testament, a biblical covenant is a legal arrangement in which one person makes unilateral decisions that affects others. So that's the point of contact and why diatheke, the Greek term, could be used for a last will and testament in extra-biblical Greek in the Hellenistic world, but also could be used for biblical covenants in the Old Testament translation into Greek and then in the New Testament. One person makes a unilateral decision that affects many others. Unlike a last will and testament, a covenant is a legal commitment between living persons. Think of a marriage covenant between a husband and wife. Think of a political treaty between a dominant king and a weaker king. And of course, think about the sovereign bond between the Lord and his people. A covenant is a bond between living people. It obligated both parties to keep their respective ends of the bargain. The Lord unilaterally sets the terms. He obligates himself by his promises. He obligates his people by his commands. He determines the consequences for breach of contract, for breach of the treaty, for violation of the covenant as well. So the servant's role basically is to receive God's covenant and say, Amen. I believe. I will obey. That actually was the way Israel responded initially at Mount Sinai, which was the right response. All that the Lord has commanded, we will do when God made his covenant. Yes, sir. So when we read Old Testament, New Testament as the two parts of our Bible, we should be reading those really as Old Covenant, New Covenant, which means we should be reading them through the lens of the prophecy we looked at in the last lecture, Jeremiah 31, where God said, I'm going to make a new covenant, not like the covenant at Sinai, 
when I took you, your fathers out of the land of Egypt and they broke that covenant. I'm going to bring forgiveness. I'm going to bring intimate knowledge. I'm going to write my law on their hearts. That's what a covenant is. Determined by God, mutual commitments. Now I emphasize that because sometimes we've talked about covenant in terms that make it sound almost like a negotiated contract. In fact, the children's catechism that, uh, that my wife and I used for our kids when they were young defined covenant as an agreement between two or more persons. An agreement between two or more persons. I want to buy that car. How much do you want for it? Back and forth, negotiated. That's not a covenant. Actually, a revision of that children's catechism has come out called First Catechism, and now it describes the covenant as a relationship that God establishes with us and guarantees by His Word. Mm. Much better. Much better. It's not just any old covenant. It's a particular kind of interpersonal relationship. And actually, my attempt to define or describe what God's covenant with His people is, are, are in these terms, and I'll, I'll give it to you a couple times. The Lord's covenant with His human servants is a bond of interpersonal commitment involving exclusive loyalty, sovereignly instituted by the Lord, expressed through their mutual obligations, and enforced by life or death consequences. A bond of interpersonal commitment involving exclusive loyalty, sovereignly instituted by the Lord, expressed through mutual obligations, enforced by life or death consequences. The Lord says, me alone, worship me alone. It's the beginning of the Ten Commandments, right? No other gods before me. Don't make images to worship them. I alone am to be your God and the object of your worship. And then there are mutual obligations. So the other commandments flow from that first commandment. But God also makes promises uh, that he will bless with long life those who obey his commands. He sovereignly institutes it all. He doesn't negotiate. He doesn't say to Israel, here are my ten suggestions. How many of them do you like? These are the commandments. You will adhere to them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. We have mutual obligations. There are consequences. If you disobey, you will be judged. In fact, covenants were typically, crucial covenants were ratified by the shedding of blood. You see it actually in Genesis 15. We don't have time to go there right now, but it's Genesis 15. But we see it also in Exodus where animals were slain and those symbolized what would happen if either the Lord or his servant were to break the covenant? What would happen to an unfaithful party to the covenant? Now, it's, there's no question that the Lord would never break his covenant. He's always faithful. But the covenant servant would well break, did break the covenant and endured the consequences. Now, what all of that helps us to see is that Christ is the one who holds the covenant together in God's grace. God had planned for Christ to come as the new Adam. He stands at the center of the covenant. He is the mediator, as I mentioned, 1 Timothy 2.5, Paul says, the, the only mediator, mediator between God and man. And he is that mediator because sent by the Father, he is the divine Lord of the covenant who makes all God's promises yes and amen. And Becoming our human brother, he's also the faithful servant of the covenant. He fulfills what we failed to fulfill on the servant's side of things. He accomplishes redemption for us. And he does it for us in such a wonderful, wonderful way. He obeys for us. He keeps covenant for us. So he deserves to be raised from the dead. That's the reward of covenant obedience, eternal life. And we benefit from his obedience. We will be raised from the dead because we're united to Christ. But what about the record of our covenant unfaithfulness? Well, Jesus came to endure the cross. Paul says, Galatians 3.13, he became a curse for us to redeem us from the curse that we might receive the blessedness of God.
So there's the other side. He's endured the covenant curse in our place. He's also earned covenant blessing in our place, and we receive those by God's gift. And so there's the wonderful thing about God's grace. He receives the covenant curse in our place, and he's earned the covenant blessing in our place, and he's making us new as covenant keepers. He is freeing us sin, from sin's power, and he's making us redeemed people. From the Lord's side, Jesus is the creator. We know that the Lord set up everything as creator to make Adam and Eve, to bring them into covenant relationship with himself, this beautiful universe that he created. They failed to keep that first covenant. That's why we need a covenant of grace. That's why we need the seed of the woman that God promised in Genesis 3.15 to keep the covenant and destroy the evil one. So God is the creator as the Lord. And of course the New Testament tells us that God the Son worked creation in keeping with the Father's plan. Colossians 1, John 1, Hebrews 1, all talk about Christ being involved in the creation of the universe. God is the provider for his people, provided manna in the wilderness. Jesus provides bread in the wilderness for his people. In fact, he is the bread of life as God provides for his people in the wilderness. Isaiah, 6, Isaiah, Isaiah 25, God promises that he will spread a rich feast of rich wine for his people. Jesus begins his miracles in the Gospel of John by providing rich wine for his people. God's a provider, creator, provider, protector. I love Psalm 107, which talks about people getting themselves in tight spots, and crying out to the Lord in their distress, including a bunch of sailors on the sea who are caught in a storm that's about to sink their ship, and they cry out to the Lord in their distress, and he answers them, and he stills the storm. And I think of Mark 4. When the disciples, Jesus is asleep, he's really human, he's that exhausted. And the disciples wake him up and say, Lord, don't you care that we're about to go down? And with a word, he stills the storm. He's the protector. He's really human, so exhausted he has to sleep. He's really divine. He's the Lord of the storm. He's the lawgiver. The Lord gives laws to his people and expects obedience. Jesus says, John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's the lawgiver. He's the judge. In Genesis 18, Abraham rightly calls his Lord the judge of all the earth. In John 5, Jesus says, the Father judges no one, but he's given all judgment to the Son, that he may, all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. Jesus is the judge at the last day. So he does everything that the covenant Lord is committed to do. And in grace, he does everything that we, the covenant servant, were obligated to do but failed to do. Adam and Eve were created with preeminence and privilege. They were made in the image of God, although they squandered it. Jesus is the one who is, Paul says in Colossians 1, the image of the invisible God who has preeminence over all things. Adam and Eve were put in a position of probation, of testing. Would they trust God's word and obey his command and his prohibition. They didn't. Jesus comes into his life and enters a whole lifetime of probation and testing. First in the wilderness, not among domesticated, tame animals like Adam had, but among the wild beasts, Mark tells us, among wild beasts, right? But Jesus obeys perfectly in a condition of deprivation and want. And not just then, but all the way through life, as the cost of obedience escalated to the point of the cross, Jesus always said, not my will, but yours be done. He stood the probation. The covenant had consequences. The product of probation, we might say. The consequences of Adam's disobedience was death for us all and condemnation. The consequences of Adam's, of Christ's, the consequences of Christ's obedience are life justification, joy, reconciliation with God, resurrection, life. So that's the lay of the land. Covenant all the way through. Relationship of God with his people all the way through. We see that on every page of the Bible. 
So it always invites us to ask, how does this text, how do the, the dynamics between the Lord and his servants, when they're faithful, when they're unfaithful, how do they all whet our appetites and, and lead our hearts forward to Christ, who is the perfect servant of the covenant for his people? Approaching the Bible as the book of the divine human relationship, that covenant keeps us alert to the pattern and network that's present in every passage. Whether or not its contents have been commented on in some New Testament text, whether or not the text contains a prophet or a priest or a king, or some prophet, priestly king, or royal theme on the surface, every text relates somehow or other to God's covenant with humanity. And since Christ is the only mediator between God and man, the only one, the mediator of the covenant of grace, every text somehow fits into that lay of the land. We don't dare leave him out of the picture. So to get the lay of the land as we're reading, looking for Christ in every scripture, we want to ask, does this passage focus on the role of the Lord in the covenant as creator, provider, protector, commander, judge? How does Jesus fulfill that role? Or does this text focus more on the role of the servant? Preeminence and privilege as image of God. Probation, the consequences. How did Jesus fulfill the servant's role for us? And does he fulfill it in us as his spirit is making us new? So in answer to that all-important how question, frankly, I haven't offered you anything very new or revolutionary. We've just been exploring the implications of the ways that the scripture shows us and that Reformed Christians have seen before of Jesus' mission as prophet and priest and king and that overarching covenant commitment of God to his people. I hope the fact that this isn't brand new you find reassuring, not disappointing. If I come up with something brand novel, you should, brand new and novel, you should definitely be suspicious. But these are things that we've, others have seen before us, and we're just sort of teasing out the implications. We're watching the New Testament writers, writers, authors, show us the road signs, the types. We're taking our cue from, the, from those types and then watching for the landmarks, prophets, priests, and kings that are identified in Reformed catechisms and really shown to us in the Bible, Deuteronomy 17, 18, and other passages. And then we're looking at the lay of the land of the covenant. So the resources we need to learn to read the Bible like Peter and Paul are not necessarily that huge commentary edited by Beale and Carson, as good as it is. Not necessarily the whole PNR series on the Gospel in the Old Testament, as great as that is. The resources belong to what's already available to us, the shared understanding of faith that the church has had. It does require hard, humble homework. It does require the enlightening and illumining work of the Spirit. We need to ask the Lord to give us eyes to see as well as hearts to receive. We need to study prayerfully, asking the Spirit of Christ, who, through the prophets, revealed Christ's sufferings and the glory that we would result from them. We need to ask the Spirit of Christ to open our minds as we open his word, longing to see Jesus on every page of the Bible.